Salim, Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Good evening ladies and gentlemen, Madame and Monsieur, Marwoi and Mutanaya. Ayuha Sayyidah, Sad. We are gathered here this evening to honor a remarkable person. A person who has strived her whole life so that her people and nation can live in peace and prosperity. A woman of first, Lady Edna Adam. But before this, I think it is imperative to thank all of you, because without you, this night would not have been possible. So thank you. I would like to thank the incredible members of the Canadian Somaliland Affairs Committee, CISA, Hassan Tahir Adam, Hersi Sultan Ismail Adam, Hussein Hashi, Ahmed Umar, Ahmed Hachi Ali, Ya Ahmed Ghani, who devoted their time, effort, and money to ensure this whole process went smoother. I would also like to thank our incredible graphics designer, Yusuf Mohammed Moussa, who helped us make this night amazing. I would like to thank Muna Adin and Siam Riyali for their incredible efforts. I would like to thank Rada Umar and Fadul Umar for their help with organizing everything from the tablecloth to the food you're eating now. Thank you so much. This year, uh, we've had a remarkable year. However, the Canadian Somali Affairs Committee was not always like this. It was founded a year and a half ago when we were starting out. We didn't have a name. We didn't have a source of funding. We didn't have, have bylaws. We didn't have anything that any regular organization would have. But we were determined and relentless. And above all else, we truly believed in creating a better world for our community and for our people. CSAC was launched on May 2018. Since then, we have had seminars, multiple community gatherings, and were overall wonderful events. The vision of CSAC is to create a conduit in which the Canadian Somaliland diaspora can channel their skills, resources, and immeasurable potential. We can only help others if we help ourselves. We are a generation that is both Canadian and Somaliland. We have a duty to our adopted homeland, Canada, and our ancestral homeland, the Republic of Somaliland. No one knows duty to Somaliland better than the hero we honor here tonight, Lady Edna Adam. In word and in deed, she has served her nation well. This love of aiding those in need was something she inherited from her father, Dr. Adam Ismail, rahimullah. She poured her life savings into her hospital. Today it is a hospital that serves thousands of Somalilanders and other people from different countries. She has trained young midwives so that maternal deaths are reduced in Somalia. She has served as foreign minister so that Somaliland's case may be heard in every corner of the world. All in all, when you see Lady Edna Adam, you see a human being who has tirelessly dedicated her life to serving the community, the people, and the progression of her homeland, the Republic of Somalia. When a woman is sagacious, when a woman is tenacious, bold and daring, she has not crossed into the threshold of manhood. She is still fully, entirely, completely a woman. If we talk about one of the greatest women in history, mentioned in our Holy Quran, Queen Balghis, she saved her entire nation from destruction. She got a letter from Nabiullah Sulaiman. Nabiu Malik, Nabiu Malik Sulaiman ibn Dawood, alayhima wa ala nabiyina salatu wa salam, who was the most powerful in history, actually, based on his government. He sent her a letter. She gathered her people and her ministers and her government. She said, Ya ayuhal mara, inni ulqiya ilayya kitabu kareem. 
إِنَّهُ مِسْلِمَانٌ وَإِنَّهُ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ أَلَّا تَعْنُ عَلَيَّ وَأَتُونِ مُسْلِمِينَ. She said, I have a letter here, a noble letter. She knew it was noble because of the makeup of the letter. Who was sending it? She knew this was no ordinary government. This was the most powerful government the world has ever witnessed. This is a government in which Allah has said in His Quran, وَزَخَرْنَا لَهُ رِيحَ تَجْرِ رُخَاءً حَيْثُ حَسَّ وَشَيَادِينَ كُلَّ بَنَاءٍ وَغَوَاسٍ وَأَخَرِينَ مُغَرَّنِينَ فَلَسْفَ We have subjected the winds to him. Every type of shaydan, every diver, and every building are at his beck and call. So she knew this was no regime. This was an irresistible government. So she gathered people and told them, I have a letter. And he is saying, come to me in submission. أَلَّا تَعْلُ عَلَيْهُ وَأَتُونِ مُسْلِمِينَ So she said, what should we do? She told her ministers, what should we do? And the ministers obviously were mostly men. So they replied as men often do reply with force. They said, قَالُوا نَحْنُ أُلُوا قُوَّةٍ أُلُوا بَأْسٍ شَدِيدٍ We are powerful and mighty. You make this, we are powerful, we can handle this. She knew this was no option. She chose reason over force. So she said to them, a remarkable statement. She said, إن الملوك إذا دخلوا أرية أفسدوها وجعلوا عزة أهلها أذلة كذلك يفعل. She said truly when kings enter a town they ruin it. They take its elite people and they humble them. And Allah confirmed her statement. كذلك يفعل. She said and this thus they they do. She saved her people from destruction. They went and they submitted. It was her decision, it was her vision. She saved her government, she saved her people, and she was a woman. That must always be remembered. As I have stated earlier, the hero we honor tonight is a woman, obviously. And she is from the Republic of Somalia, a country for over two decades, was under the heel of a brutal, relentless tyrant. And when the people of Somalia demanded their freedom, they were showered with bombs. Bombs that rained night and day. Artillery rounds were fired in the cities of Hargeisa and Burro, Gabile and Berbera, completely decimating the once lively towns. One could hear the wailing of widows and the crying of orphans, rivers of tears, the besieged people. We knew then, as we know now, freedom is never free. Despite all of that, our enemies could not break our iron will. We not only survived the war, but won it, successfully defeating a much larger, better equipped force. However, we know the changes brought forth by armed revolution seldom last, unless the violent storm of revolution is replaced by the serenity of reformation. Today we are alive and together, so let us work together for the betterment of all. Our hero in the Abbey has faced many obstacles, but none of them deterred her. In fact, we emboldened her and made her stronger. So when people tell you that you are incapable, the task is impossible, and the journey too long, you just let them know that I'm not alone. Thank you.
a couple of them at my invitation. And I want to say thank you for being part of number one of my life and have taught me the ways of um, right and wrong. And I also want to say thank you for what you contributed to the Somaliland community, not only in Canada, not only Somaliland, but throughout the world. Madam, you're an inspiration for the people of the world to, to focus. You're an inspiration for the people and the young ones to, to look up to. You've done wonderful work, and I am there with you, shoulder to shoulder, as we make sure that the vulnerable ones always have a hand up, not a, and a hand up. Tonight, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate you on the occasion of the recognition night being held in your honor. Over the past four decades, the work that you've done in advancing the state of health and awareness of sexually transmitted diseases has been monumental and life-changing for many individuals in Somalia. Your advocacy and humanitarian spirit has also served as a shining example in the ways that we can make positive difference within our communities. Please accept our best wishes for this momentous occasion. Madam, Isla, Ma Madam Edna Anand Ismail, can I invite you to the stage? for welcoming me one more time to your great country, Canada. I'm happy to be here and to see so many young people, the energy of this hall and the beauty of the uh, people sitting here in front of me is so overwhelming that I may not be able to speak tonight. Um, but in spite of my emotions, I will speak. And I will speak about a topic that I love to speak about. Because I'll be speaking about a country that needs to be spoken about. I will speak about a great country that is an example to many African countries. A great country in the Horn of Africa that is called the Republic of Somaliland. because it needs to be spoken about. Its history has been wiped out. Its accomplishments have been overlooked. Its presence on this planet has been denied. And yet, it is a country that needs to be known. It's a country of hope. It's a country of development. It's a country that the world should be proud of. It's certainly a country that Somalilanders should be proud about. On that site, which was once a killing ground, I know many of you know it, once a killing ground, once a trash dump, the government bulldozed it for me and carted away 32 truckloads of trash from it. Now I live on it. And it's my choice. I know where the Hiltons and Sheratons are in this world. That's where I live. That's where I call home. And we built it. Next, please. And we built it. Next, please. And we built it. Next, please. And four years later, we finished it. eight months before the hospital was opened. I had no water. I had no electricity. I had a bucket for water. I have a watchman who was hard of hearing, who I couldn't call. And then at night I would have a torch and I would flick, flick, flick. And then people would say, yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, But it was difficult in the daytime because I would call him and he wouldn't hear me, so I had to go and actually touch him. He was supposed to be God and me. But I'm here. I lived it. 
I loved it. In fact, the first night I moved there, and my, my candle blew out, and I couldn't find matches, and I, and I couldn't find where things were, and I eventually called him, and I said, you know, Adam, all you can, all, all, all you can. And I wanted the Adam, I wanted the brush to brush my teeth, because I couldn't find my, my, my toothbrush. And he said, Hey, Skasa, how old are you? I'm not going to go out there. You just go to sleep. You don't need a stick, you know. I'm protecting you. Just go to sleep. He said, No, no, I need a stick. I need to brush my teeth. That's how I lived it. That's how I lived it. I still have no air conditioning. I don't have a fan in my office or in my bedroom. I have one in the living room because I have guests. But I don't need it. My first office was the shade of a tree. Get Garawala. When they were building the hospital, Garawala tree was my, my office. I took many decisions under that Garawala tree, sitting on cement blocks. And I would receive people say, No, 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 in four years. Four years. And I was there every morning at six. And I was the last one out. I had a little uh, whistle here. Whenever I had some problems with somebody up there, I was going, brrr, kashar kaasam sotik. No, 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 whatever. You know, the, the window is too much on this side. No, no, hamal skaadi. No, skaadi. This is what I want. That's, that's how we got it done. And even today, my, my room is this one here, on the corner, and the pediatric ward is below me. So at night, I hear the kids crying downstairs, and I say, what are you doing to this kid? This kid's been crying for 10 minutes. What are you doing to this kid? We're trying to find a vein. My goodness, you're killing it. Calm it. Talk to it. Appease it. And then, then find a way to, get, to find a vein. Don't force it. That's my home. That's my child. That's a child who has been brought to us for protection and treatment. And I say, Alhamdulillah, if we can look after that child the way Subhanahu wa Ta'ala Rabbana would want us to look after that child, then we have done our duty. And anything that has ever been taught to me has been worth it. Next, please. And of course, we, we train people. Next, please. Today, we have delivered, well, till December, we've delivered over 25,000 mothers and babies. <laughs> and alhamdulillah, we have reduced maternal mortality to less than a, a fifth of the national average. We lost, we lost 68 mothers who we could have saved if they had been brought sooner. That's the hospital built on a trash dump. That's a hospital where people used to kill people to save lives, round the clock. We train, the, we, we train the, the students, we treat the rich. I want a private room for my wife, okay, that's a private room. But we treat the poor, the ones that nobody else wants to treat. They smell too bad, they have no money, they're leaking too much. All kinds of things coming out of their bodies. That's the one I built the hospital for. That's the one. I have staff. I need to pay salaries. I have 300 staff that I pay a salary to. Because six years ago, I had another child called University. A university has 1,500 students. And it has another 150 teachers, and professors, and staff, and office staff, and cleaners, and cooks and drivers, and guards, 
and electricians. 300 families, 300 people, each month I have to pay a salary to. That's why I travel. That's why I get invited by universities to lecture. That's why I get an honorarium. That's, why I, that's where I spend my UN pension. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. And if an old woman, a retired old woman can do it, anybody can do it. You can all do it. You give a kid a new life. It's a couple of uh, Starbucks coffees, right? <laughs> Starbucks is not going to be happy with me. Because I'm going to say, less coffee, less Starbucks, less whatever, less fast, fast food. And for every $15 you save, you're giving a child glasses. Not, not the designer ones, for a couple of hundred. Enough for them to read see, to learn. Are any of you wearing glasses know how, how precious these things are? You can take my car, but don't take my glasses. Fifteen dollars. So don't think about millions. Think about an act, a charity that will change somebody's life. Using that knife for somebody who has HIV AIDS and then using it on your little daughter who's seven years old, and maybe giving her hepatitis or HIV AIDS. Or maybe getting her to bleed and die. Because they do die. And they bring them to us so late that she's just a body, she's just a collapsed child. And she's been bleeding since six o'clock this morning. And they bring her to the hospital at nine o'clock, dead. Why? Wrong. Do something about it. Next thing. Next, please. I'm going to leave this with you guys so you can watch it again, share it, if you like. Next, please. I want you to look at that picture. There's five women there. Dr. Emil, Dr. Naima, Lady Edna there, she's the anesthetist, the instrument nurse. A floating nurse, five women operating to save a life. Now, to me, that is Samadhi Nath. Samadhi country that is left for dead. That country whose daughters were denied education today have scientists and doctors and surgeons and pediatricians. And engineers and lawyers. There's a Somaliland Women Lawyers Association. Did you know that? Somaliland Women Doctors Association. Did you know that? Somaliland Women Engineers. Did you know that? That's Somaliland. So don't let anybody tell you. Just because you're not recognized by the ignorant world that refuses to recognize your country. Don't believe you don't exist. Let them prove that. Let them do half as much as Somaliland has done. Let them come up to our level. Let them become as accountable with our resources as we are. Let them have democracy like we have. Let them have books and schools and universities and colleges. Yes, we need to fix our country better. Of course. Which country does not? The richest country in the world needs fixing. There's always things to fix. The road to development is always under construction. As an old saying, every country has things to fix. And we have more to fix than others because more destruction has happened to us. But who's going to do it? No little green men are coming from the moon to do it for us. It's for you and me to do it. And stop bickering about clans and political parties. If you don't fix, if you don't protect your environment, if you don't protect your human rights, if you don't protect your democracy, 
If you don't protect yourselves, nobody will come from the moon and wait for you. And your country will go to the dogs. And you will be playing into the hands of those who put tanks and planes in the air to bomb you. You will be bombing each other. Because denying your energy to develop your country is as bad as the one who sent a bomb to hit those innocent people. With your mouth and with your propaganda, you are destroying Somaliland. You're killing, you're, you're stopping the development that we need to make. We need to move forward. We need to get up and go. We've had enough time to heal. We've had enough time to grow. We've had enough time to learn. Let's put it to action now. Hydrocephalus or hydrocephalus. But as soon as that child is born, they put a shunt to drain the cerebrospinal fluid. There are many professors teaching you in universities who have a shunt in there, who had it put in there 50, 60 years ago. And live a normal life and grow and develop. This kid has teeth, and his head is bigger than his mother's. When we send a kid like that abroad, it costs $15,000 just for the operation. Not to count the ticket, the flight, the hotels, the translators, the interpreters, the visas. $20,000 minimum is what it costs a family. How many families in Somalia have $20,000? How many have $2,000? How many have $200? We operate them for free. And a few years ago, Dr. Shukri, who is the, the one who is training the expert, and she, we get patients from anywhere, and I took it to, the, to Washington, D.C., there was a, a conference there, the American College of Surgeons, and she made a presentation about, you know, children with the shots. And this is too, it's, it's too good to be true. A Saman girl in Samaniland is inserting shots. This we gotta see. So somebody went up to her and said to, uh, after she you know came down from the podium and said, oh, that was a very interesting presentation. Uh, when will you trade? Samaniland. And where were you trained to insert the, sh the shunts? In Somaliland. Where else? Where else? All in Somaliland. <laughs> in Hordo. Painful kid burned everywhere. My God. No skin left and couldn't swallow, couldn't close her mouth, couldn't drink. The poor kid and the pain and the contractures and so on. And we found a little skin somewhere in the next place. And we were able to release her neck. And to me, that is the most beautiful girl in the world. So I'm going to leave you with several messages. I hope you've picked up messages the last hour. Or have I been speaking for an hour? I don't believe it. <laughs> You're watching. We want him more. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot that needs doing. And there's a lot you can do. And there's a lot we need to find partners to help us do it better. But I want you to take that challenge. I don't want to have to come back and haunt you from the next world and say, ah, you haven't done my promise. You come from a great country. Be proud of who you are. Call your country by its rightful name. And not that they're Rukhoi now, you're not Rukhoi or anything. You're Somaliland of a goodness. <laughs> you're not a fraction, you're not a splinter, you're not a secessionist, you're not a breakaway region, you're Somaliland. Hey! You're older, you're more senior than others. And if you're not recognized, it's the world's loss. 
because I would rather be unrecognized and as beautiful as Somaliland is, and to be as democratic as Somaliland is, and to be progressing as Somaliland has progressed, to have women surgeons fixing things that need to be fixed, than to be recognized, only to become a loss and a burden to the world. Somalia has more money. Somalia steals more. They still send me their kids to treat. With all the billions and the rivers of money that flows in Somalia, they still come to poor Somaliland, unrecognized Somaliland, to fix their sick. Find each other. If anybody is too slow, leave them behind. Get the ones who are fast, those who have a vision. Find each other. Work together. Move forward. Time is against you. 30 years of doing nothing is too long. People have forgotten our cause. Remind them of it. And don't shy away from telling the world where Somaliland is. Because too many people have been telling the world there is no place like Somaliland. Love yourselves. Love your country. Be proud of it. And say, Alhamdulillah. I'm the one And um, the reason why I'm on stage today is to present a Medical Excellence Award to one of my heroes. And the more I learned about him, the more I fell in love with this person and I felt inspired and motivated by him. That doctor is Dr. Ishmael Adam. Just to talk a little bit about him. Dr. Ishmael was born in Arbaso, Odessa, received his medical degree in surgery from Somali National University facility degree in 1982. In 84, he became a district medical officer and coordinator of primary health care and chef. In 85, Dr. Ishmael ran, also ran a private inpatient and outpatient maternity clinic called Hussu. Dr. Ishmael came to Canada as a refugee with his wife and his son, January 1990. He did his residency in general and psychiatry and fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry at Allegheny General Hospital, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He became a member of the Council of Pennsylvania, Hamilton University School of Medicine. And from 2006 to 2001, Dr. Uh, Adam has been a child and adolescent psychiatrist to do a private practice in London, Ontario. All of this, all this work he's been doing in, in, in Canada, while he's been helping out and volunteering and giving his time and energy and money and resources to helping people back home in Somaliland. And we, we want to appreciate him, we want to and show our gratitude, and we want him to come upstairs, come here now, and give us the word. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
وحي فوكس وتأبي هو شاع هيسو إيه يوم بحري إيه يوم مدينة فوق الجاريس منفع كمرته أو ما كمرته أو مقع كمرته وحي كرته أو كلية ده الكي يقول له جاه يسكت يسكت يعني هي كرته أو كلية هم بليو هلك هو شكمل ثور أنا هذان من هاي خير سومار إلهم هو مكو إلا ودون أنا بنا أبالك ما إلا ودون كلام عليه I'm raised in Canada, going to school in America, born in Saudi Arabia, from a place that doesn't exist is where my parents are from, and it's called Somaliland. And he said to me, well, I'm in the oil business, is there oil in Somaliland? I said, even if there was oil, my people are so weak they can't even dig a hole. You know? So it doesn't make sense to us to see these people who are talk talking oil. So he goes, what do they need? Like medical supplies and that type of stuff? I said, yes. He goes, do you know of a place? I said, yes. Do you have any information I could see? I said, yes. And I opened up my suitcase. I gave it to him. The next day he told me to come to um, his office. And as I came, 23, I don't know what he's doing. I walk into his office. There's a team of people and a room maybe this big of $500,000 of medical equipment to say Somaliland. of meeting Edna, and at that time, you know, I sent her an email hoping she would respond, <laughs> and she does her own emails, which is amazing, because I know my friends who don't even know how to, you know, use technology, but I think because of the access to the internet and everything she was doing in technology, it made it easy for me to communicate with somebody in another world, in another country, and what was crazy was, here I am, this college kid who doesn't have the money to go to school, and now I have to raise $50,000 to ship this medical equipment. So I went to our community, and they looked at me like I was crazy. They said, sell some of this stuff, give it away. It was just bad idea after bad idea. Finally, after eight months of just not knowing what to do, and these people mad at me for not taking this, all this stuff for this country that doesn't exist out of their space, um, I, found, I went to Juma Prayer, and I found this Iraqi man, and this Iraqi brother helped me raise the money and gave me the $50,000 because he said it's my obligation not just to help the Iraqi community, but the entire Muslim community. And that's how we got the Why I say that to you is because I wanted to speak to the young people in this room and tell them that your journey, just like how these organizers are here on the stage today, is going to start from one play, and that one play is going to lead to another play because after 2006, I said, Ed, Ed I want to do a, uh, another project with you. And she said, what? I said, I want to make a documentary on your story. I feel like we have to tell the story well beyond you to keep, to keep like, hope and legacy for our country alive. She didn't ask me what my credentials were. She didn't say anything about you can't do this, but she allowed me to do it. And then in the process of allowing me to do this documentary, um, I saved my last bit of rent. I did whatever I could to produce this thing with the team I had. And it was literally the best timing ever because Edda was on a hot streak. She was um, in the Clinton Global Initiative back-to-back -back years. Bill Clinton and, and the Clinton Foundation was like enamored with the Somaliland cause. She was Newsweek's top 100 most influential women in the world. So it was just this amazing story that the world didn't know. And I wanted to produce it. I wanted to do it. And then the last day that I'm supposed to get all these amazing interviews, I run out of money. And I'm like waiting, and like all these amazing celebrities who know my aunt are trying to interview her, and I don't have a camera because my cameraman literally walked off the stage. As he, I couldn't pay him. And as I, I was feeling defeated, Edda taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, I want to talk to some people. Can you come in the room with me? And then those people was the New York Times and PBS, and they wanted to do a million dollar documentary on Edna. And she allowed them to say, take Ahmed with you. So, you know, she it was able to invest in me, but that moment of me going back to Somaliland, I always said, if I go home, and just like some of the kids in this room who haven't been home, I wanted to go home with a purpose. Because our community, once you get home, 
after a couple of days, Allah wa ki so and so. But then five minutes later, Allah wa fur the marini hai, lag mahai sto. And so it gets old quick. They're going to ask for money, you don't have nothing. So I said, if I ever go to back home the first time, even if it's a small project, I have to go home with a purpose. And Edna was, Edna's cause was so strong that that was the purpose for me. And when I did that documentary and worked with her, I got to see every day the day-to-day -day lifestyle of Edna going not just from the hospital, but going into the most remote regions of our country and talking to those local people on the ground, speaking to the elders, speaking to the chiefs of these clans and everybody just to make them get along. As a kid who grew up in the projects now, you know, and growing up in, in tough neighborhoods in Toronto, to compare the fact that this lady seen more AK-47s than the biggest gangsters in the world, it, it's an understatement, but she knew how to talk to people and she knew how to get everybody together. And that's kind of what I wanted to see happen. I'm happy with the success that I have as a young immigrant coming to Canada, but I'm more happy to see that the next generation is trying to step up. Because if we were to ask ourselves 30 years ago where our community would be 30 years from now, I know we would not be saying this is the state that we wanted it in. When we first came to Canada, we had amazing programming. We had Mahabadi, Sir Johnny McDonald. We had picnics every Eid. We knew each other. We knew each other's kids. I've been in places now where two guys are about to fight and they don't know their first cousins. <laughs> you know, take that in. I've been watching TV and at 11 o'clock at the news, we're just praying that the breaking news is not Somali kid on the news. That's not our solution. That's not, it doesn't make sense. You have to come with a plan. You have to prepare days like this. It's actionable. It's great Edna came. It's great that she spoke, but she was speaking to the actions and our actions are very important. What happens when one of our children or somebody gets arrested, the amazing women in our community, before you know it, have bail? You know, we have the best community organizers in the world, and our female um, community has been amazing, but as a speaking from a male's voice, I also feel like there's more that we have to do, and there's more responsibility and initiative we have to do. The room here, I could look right now and see it's 80% women because they've always been at the table for opportunities to help everybody, but we haven't been at the table to help each other. So for me, I really want to support that. And I want to speak to all the people who weren't in the room because of being dismissed or feeling dismissed. Our society is very dismissive. Like, you know, if you come here and you do stuff that's too Canadian, Allah Ninkasu, he lost his culture. You know, and then if you go home to learn your culture, they say to you in your society, well, who can what the guy Alice? <laughs> so it's confusing. You, you, you spent the money to go home, but they don't accept you, and then you come here and they don't accept you. So there's a lost group of kids in the society that we're not utilizing because they feel disenfranchised. And we can't have that. We can't have that. We need to be in a position where we can help and grow. Everything that I learned from Edna's journey helped me build my company because I focus on philanthropy, I focus on giving back to young children, I focus back on mentorship and, and, and creating those seeds of the future because, you know, we've had that success story in the Somali community individually, but the Somaliland community as a whole has issues. And some of those issues are even local, where there's neighborhoods in Toronto, in Sweden, in all these places that our people are calling no-go zones. You don't go there. In, in last June, I was in Sweden, and Quincy Jones' son, the guy who created Michael Jackson, and Naomi Campbell, supermodel, are asking me to go to this community, a Somali community in Sweden, because the police have deemed it a no-go zone. And nobody can go, so if you're from these neighborhoods, you're not getting a job, you're just going to sit there until they figure out a way to either deport you or keep you out of the Swedish society. And I don't want our people to fall back because we're such educated people. You know, we're such strong people, we have a great story, and Edna's story is just one of those amazing stories that we're celebrating tonight. But anyway, our community after this can support organizations like this one here who put this event together. That's what I want to see going forward. I don't want to see people complaining about how this did this or this did that. Just ask yourself how you could fix it and come up to the organizers of this organization and all the other ones that are starting and say, how can we help you grow? That's what other societies do. That's how they move forward. And that's what we I love each and every single one of you guys. I thank Edna from the bottom of my heart for making my dreams come true and for keeping it real with me. And I just want to do that with other groups and I want you guys to do it with each other. Just, just don't make it too personal.
you know, just keep it real and inshallah khair. I pray for everybody in this room. Jazakallah. Thank you.
الماي بس هو الماي ما كذبت انا ما قدرت ارصدها دلك هنا هلا عاويه كل يوم يروح يقول لك 